obviously both of which are uh, are with us here in the room. Do you want to give us a wave? Um, so the purpose of the project overall really is to investigate what an alternative security politics in the UK might look like and in particular one that goes beyond critique and deconstruction to engage more uh, more concretely uh, with security policy uh, and, and in particular the lived experiences of insecurity particularly for the most insecure both in the UK and, and via the actions of the UK government abroad. So that, that's, the, that's just a headline of the broad project that we are uh, taking forward. Um, and this is uh, an opportunity to engage with some critical academics, scholarship uh, and thinking about security in the UK. Uh, and for that purpose, we've got a great panel, uh, five uh, experts that have looked at issues of security from uh, a range of different perspectives and from a critical sensibility. Uh, we're going to hear from the five uh, in the order in which they appeared on the website. So we'll hear from Ruth Blakely, uh, University of Sheffield first, then Harmony Torres, University of Kent, Philippe Froud, uh, now the University of Ottawa, previously with us at York, uh, Nisha Kapoor, also previously with us at York, but now at University of Warwick, and then finally with Paul Rogers, uh, University of Bradford. Um, we'll hear from, from each in turn, uh, and then we'll open up the floor for um, discussion, questions, comments, uh, please feel free to use the chat. I'll keep my eye on it. My, uh, Tom and Ellie will also keep an eye on it on my behalf as well. And hopefully we'll be able to have a really good discussion uh, after we've heard from our five speakers. Um, so with that, uh, my pleasure to hand over first to Ruth. Thank you so much, Nick. I trust you can hear me. Yes, good, okay. Um, so the uh, homework question that gave us was what does it mean to think and act critically in relation to UK security politics? And I suppose I want to try and answer this by talking through how I've spent the last 10 years in my research life and I guess some of the lessons I've learned about how one engages the British state over some of its less pleasant security practices. So over the last 10 years, I've worked with um, my colleague Sam Raphael at the University of Westminster to investigate the CIA's programme for the rendition, detention and torture of terror suspects. I'm sure for all of you, the extent of the torture and its details are known and you're aware of how grim they are um, because they have now been very well documented. What Sam and I did was assemble compelling evidence of the details of the torture and the reach of the CIA's network of secret prisons. And we were able to do this because we partnered with a community of litigators, human rights NGOs and investigative journalists. The key focus of the work was to investigate the extent of UK collusion with CIA torture. And despite repeated denials by Bush, uh, by Bush obviously, but also by Tony Blair and uh, many in the British government, and su subsequently uh, successive governments, we were able to uncover considerable knowledge of and participation in mistreatment of prisoners by MI6 and MI5 personnel. Eventually, after many years of, of research and quite slow work, our findings were corroborated by the long delayed Intelligence and Security Committee's investigation, which we did actually give evidence to, and that was published in 2018. What that showed, and, and this supported our findings, was that British intelligence knew about, suggested, planned, agreed to, or even paid for others to conduct rendition operations in more than 70, 70, 70 cases in the war on terror. And they did so with the approval and acquiescence at the highest levels of, of the British government. Those intelligence agencies were also engaged in sharing and receiving intelligence from overseas partners, despite being fully aware of abuse and torture of prisoners in at least 232 cases. So our foray into this research on CIA torture coincided with increasing concern among UK policymakers that academic research was inaccessible and therefore of questionable value given its cost to the UK taxpayer. The outcome of the debates that ensued was increased government scrutiny of the extent to which academic research has tangible impacts outside of academia, 
whether politically, economically, scientifically or socially. There's been plenty of criticism among academics of the mechanisms by which the government seeks to evaluate impact, as well as the politics that underpin this endeavour. And so many academics are concerned that the impact agenda has quite perverse effects on what we choose to study and how we study it. I should say that I do share some of those concerns, but my own experience has been much more positive than these debates might suggest. Studying the dirty secrets of our state is not straightforward. Accessing data is difficult. But Sam and I are really indebted to the human rights organisations and litigators, especially UK legal action charity Reprieve, who were incredibly generous with their data, their time and their connections. In turn, they have appreciated our commitment to use our social science training to work with huge amounts of raw data that they had secured, but did not necessarily have the skills or time or resources to make meaningful use of. So we have benefited from their, their connections built up over many years with other national and international NGOs and litigators, domestic and international courts, and sympathetic journalists and politicians. Through these collaborations, we've been able to get our research findings into the hands of litigators representing victims of torture. We've also been able to support their advocacy efforts with a strong evidence base. And these efforts have resulted in some real wins, as well as many frustrations. For me, this is what it means to think and act critically in relation to UK security politics. It is about building collaborations with non-academic partners who are well-practiced and well-placed for the endless struggle with power to hold our leaders to their fundamental human rights commitments. It is about supporting them with robust research and learning from their expertise in defending human rights, whether in policy circles or the courts. So these collaborations have taught me a great deal about the need for absolutely forensic and robust academic work if we're going to bring about transformative change. By painstakingly walking the Intelligence and Secu Security Committee through the evidence of UK collusion in torture, with reference to specific articles of international human rights law, we were taken seriously. Our findings were given due weight by the committee and were then reflected in the committee's conclusions. So for me, that engagement with international law in critical security studies is a question of pragmatism. If scholarship is aimed at changing the world in positive ways, we need strategies for achieving those goals. Engaging explicitly with the provisions of international law allows us to speak to the state in terms it understands. This does not mean that I think the system is perfect, or that law is necessarily always adequate. But I've come to understand that it is one of very few avenues at our, disposable, at our disposal to bring about that change we seek. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Um, lots of food for thought there, thank you. Um, next we'll hear from uh, Harmony. Hello everyone, thank you very much, Ruth. Um, it's, I think it fits quite well with what I was um, wanting to, to contribute here. Um, so this, this is part of a, a reflection that, that's been going on that I've been having also linked to the, 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 uh, the workshop that was held at York. And the question was how uh, we engage with the state, uh, whether we engage with the state and how we engage with the state. And for those who, who know me a little and know that I engage with the state quite uh, and with states and, and the security sector in, in uh, regularly, uh, whether it's uh, through, um, through NATO or, or other international institutions. And I do this with the aim of trying to convince them to engage uh, in counterterrorism policies through non-violent means or less violent means. So that has been what I've been doing for, for the, the past 15 years. Um, the, the question I, 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 I've come to is in a certain sense is by Engaging in impact um, and impact work, uh, I have found myself more and more in um, situations and in engaging in practices that, that I 
find personally uh, extremely difficult and problematic. And um, the question then becomes, has become for me, uh, how, what are the, the costs, the, the personal costs to a certain degree, uh, and, but also the costs in terms of the work that I produce of a continued engagement uh, with, with security services? Where does, how do I know that I'm being co-opted and to what degree I'm being co-opted? Uh, how do I know that my, I feel as if the goalpost is, my goalposts are moving without me necessarily knowing that they're moving and realizing that they're moving until all of a sudden I'm in a room and I, and I, I realize that I'm part of a discussion, the basis of which is so far from what I believe in that I all of a sudden wonder how I got there and, and, and what I'm doing in that room. Um, so the, the, the question that, that I, I've, um, I'm, I'm trying to grapple with is how to stay inside. And so increasingly, uh, as critical scholars, we had the advantage for a, for a long time, I would say, of being on the outside and saying, this is what is not working with, with the impact agenda. This is not what is not working with, with expertise that is completely tied in with the state. Um, this is, I come from a critical terrorism studies background and that was one of the key points of critical terrorism studies was terrorism studies is too far implicated with state structures and therefore is unable to see the violence that is uh, propagated and put forward by, by the state itself, right? That was one of the main points. But increasingly as the, as the impact agenda spreads within the university system, and I agree with Ruth in many, many ways there, there are very important things that come out of it and very um, things that, that we need that come out of it. But at the same time, what happens is that more and more uh, scholars from the critical ilk find themselves in these rooms. And, and being a critical scholar in these rooms is, is not as, uh, I don't think anyone thinks it's easy, but it, it, it certainly <laughs> represents a whole series of um, complications. There, there's a few examples and a few points I want to raise. One of them is a, a question of, um, of economics. So if you're, if you're traveling, I, I recently published a piece with Lucas Van Milders on, um, on a trip that I, I did to Mogadishu for, for the UN. And what happens in the end is I end up uh, in a bunker that, is, uh, that, that the UN is paying $175 a night for me to stay in. And that the profit of me staying in that bunker is going to a man called Lord Westbury, who is one of the biggest private security contractors in the UK. So my presence in Mogadishu International Airport is fundamentally leading to money from the Norwegian government being given to the UN for me to speak about peace and reconciliation in Somalia without ever leave it leading, leaving the, the compound of the airport and that money, eventually, at least some of it, ends up being going in the pockets of a private security and military contractor in London. So these are the kind, this is the economics of it. The social aspect of it and the, the, the sociology of it is that I end up also entering a system and entering a compound where most Somalis are not allowed to enter. Right? I enter, enter a system in which uh, I am there to speak about Somalia with very little contact at all with Somalis. And, and that my expertise, my theoretical expertise, is being brought, uh, even if it's on negotiations, even if it's on nonviolent intervention, it is nonetheless seen as a universal expertise coming from a global north institution to explain to the south what is happening in their lands. So there's a sociology and the, there's an ethics of it that is incredibly problematic. Now, I am not saying that this shouldn't be done. I am just saying that we have, we, I have um, uh, increasingly found myself in, uh, in, in very real personal dilemmas and, and, and professional dilemmas on whether to take up certain uh, positions, regardless of the kind of arguments that I'm making. And I continue to advocate nonviolence, right? I could, that is, I, you know, I, I was taught by Paul Rogers. I, <laughs> I'm still, I, I still go down that line. But, uh, but I have entered because of, uh, through impact, into a, an, a, an economic system and a, a, a sociology that, it, that is incredibly problematic. So then the qu final question, uh, and the question I wanted to raise is, is the question of um, that uh, 
that Olivia Rizzo puts forward so well, she says that the question of ethical retreat, right? And, and the question then becomes, should the, should the role of um, critical scholarship in security, uh, particularly, be one of trying to find a way to prevent uh, governments and our, our governments and our states from carrying out actions of, uh, that are repressive and violence and looking at that violence rather than going and trying to seek to do something towards an ac a positive action, but rather to focus primarily on reducing the negative actions. And what does that mean for us in terms of academics? Where do we retreat from? What is, the, is that something that we need to be doing or not? Um, I don't know how long I spoke because I lose track of my time, but uh, is that about five minutes? That's great, Harmony. Okay. Thanks very much. I, I've, I've put in the chat a link to your article, by the way. Okay, thank you. Which is a great article. Um, many thanks. Uh, Philippe, over to you. Great. Um, thank you. Um, so I, I come at this discussion from, um, the, from my previous work and from engagement in work on uh, critical border studies and migration. And so uh, typically I, I found this the title of the the title of our roundtable today particularly interesting because I think it challenges a lot of the basis of certainly some of the work in uh, on borders and migration, especially after 9-11, where we were kind of in a framework of thinking about the exception, uh, very strongly driven by the work of Giorgio Gambon. And I think that led in some ways to a particular posture towards engagement of standing from outside, right? The critic is the one that stands outside the kind of structures of the liberal state and points at the hypocrisy of the liberal state in carrying out illiberal practices at borders and elsewhere in the war on terrorism. Um, and so I think that the, the idea of you know, security politics as imagined here in our discussion today is closer to a vision of perhaps, let's say, um, some of Andrew Neal's work about security as politics, thinking through the role of for example, professional bureaucratic politics and in, in his particular case, parliamentary politics. So engaging, I think there is a need to kind of engage more directly with these kind of institutional instances uh, of security politics. So what I wanna kind of discuss today is three kind of buckets into which I've organized what I think of as important trends in security politics as understood that way. Um, so. One of these is the sort of transnational inflection of security politics, because I think we need to have an understanding of what security politics looks like in order to understand how we position ourselves with and against it. Um, and so the first one is this transnational inflection. Um, and so we've seen in the news this week, for example, the UK thinking about offshoring uh, asylum processing. Uh, I think this reflects, again, the, the transnational inflection of practices of policy learning from countries like Australia. It also reflects um, the, the need for us to investigate some of these connections and investigate some of the histories of practices like this. So I think, again, if we look at the transnational nature of security, again, this is nothing new. Uh, DJ Bigo has talked about this quite a lot. Um, but I think in terms of our critical posture, what does that push us to do? So I'll give you an example from my own work. Um, so I've been looking more recently at uh, vigilantism in West Africa, uh, and particularly in Burkina Faso. Um, and I think one of the the ways of maintaining a critical posture in this particular area is not geographically essentializing some of the work that we do. And, and what I notice in this particular area is that we end up, and I, certainly I've been guilty of this, is making divisions between vigilantism as it's expressed in the global south and failing to make connections to practices that are actually quite similar in the global north, like armed groups in the US doing roadblocks, right? This is very recent. And so failing to kind of draw these types of connections. And so I think part of the critical ethos is also understanding these transnational inflections of security and how we as, as scholars can also make those connections. So that's the kind of first bucket of ideas. Um, the second one is about the state and the non-state and how they interconnect. And so I think there is a need to engage with security politics at the state level, but we also need to look at uh, the ways that security practices are more generalized and broadened throughout society. So an example of this is when we look at some of the great work out there on counter radicalization, especially in the UK, uh, the role of medical professionals in the NHS, for example, is absolutely crucial when we think about where do we find security politics in practice, right? It's often very, very far 
uh, beyond the state. And so I think for us in terms of a critical posture and in terms of our critical analysis, it means that we need to uh, think of a slightly more flattened view in terms of the types of violences and the types of security practices that we're actually um, analyzing across state and non-state. The third bucket um, is in terms of digital mediation. So again, this is nothing radically new as a proposition, right? So security practices are increasingly digitally mediated, increasingly algorithmic. Um, and so this is an important arena for security politics and the contestation of security politics. So again, our uh, ethical and critical posture needs to engage with these particular practices, but avoid the kind of techno fetishism that goes uh, with it. So uh, I'll give you an example from my own recent work as well. So I've been thinking uh, a lot about the automation of border security, and that has meant working with uh, border security authorities in Canada in the development of um, some new technologies. And so part of it, I think, means that we need to engage early, right? And so I'm, I'm quite um, as much as I'm a fan of the idea from Richard Jackson, for example, of withdrawing our kind of critical legitimacy that we might give to the state, I think we also need, in a critical standpoint, to be attempting to move the needle, right, and act as informers rather than necessarily just informants for the state. Uh, and so, for example, in my own work, this has meant pointing out ethical questions at the very beginning of technological development where you have a very engineer-led process that's not taking into account some of the multiple critiques that have been made in the last 20 years of uh, critical security studies. Um, and just a final point uh, in terms of thinking about how we do critique, um, I think it's important for us to move away from the kind of idea of the critic uh, standing and telling people off and standing from a position of great authority. Um, I'm, I'm quite persuaded by, by recent debates in critical security studies in particular about recognizing how distributed knowledge is and how we play a role in, in mediating knowledge. Um, and I think that there's a kind of very interesting, uh, modest ethical posture that can come uh, from that. Um, I think I've used my five minutes, so I'll, I'll leave it at that and I look forward to our, um, to our discussion. Great, Philippe, thank you. Uh, thanks for organising it into those, those three buckets. Um, very helpful in terms of how we might uh, think about how, how those broad sets of ideas relate to our own areas of, of work and thinking about what it means to be critical. Um, Nisha, uh, can I invite you to, uh, to take the floor next? Yep. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for the invitation to this. Um, I guess I just want to start by saying that I do I really appreciate what the other speakers have already said before me and I um, you know, ag agree with much of what's been said and could echo that. I guess um, in previous work that I have done, I've, I've, I've also um, thought a lot about these questions and um, engaged with or you know, been doing research around the hard end of the security state, <clears throat> thinking about kind of um, what other approaches to security or securitization might be and might mean. Um, so I guess, but I guess one of the things that I wanted to do for, for this short uh, intervention would be, what was to just think about security, um, perhaps more proactively rather than reactively. So um, a bunch of us, Ruth um, and I and uh, several other scholars who have been involved in security research in various ways related um, to the war on terror produced a policy report last uh, last year or the year before, I can't remember. Um, I think it was published last year, um, which aimed in part to offer a kind of alternative to counter terrorist, terrorism policy as it um, currently stands. And one of the things um, that we were keen to do as part of that was to try and push for an alternative way of thinking about security and securitization that had a more sort of grounded approach. Um, so, I mean, in, in contemporary discussions of and policy approaches to security, the frame, as has been said, of, of sort of national security, security in the name of the nation state and sort of trans you know, um, international hegemonic actors tends to dominate. The notion of security as something that is done to prevent or safeguard against potential dangers that threaten the nation state interests is normalized in, in terms of our understanding of what security is. 
um, which usually both functions to um, serve the interests of the political establishment and corporate business interests, um, as we've heard, but also I think simultaneously disarms us from thinking more critically and carefully about what security ought to be or as sort of security might be in its more desirable or meaningful sense. Um, so, you know, security is, is often performed by a state securitization um, and it concerns the management of public order, the policing of the polity, um, usually in a kind of liberal capitalist state sense to protect individual life, liberty and rights and, and property rights, um, typically. And there's been much critique of this, critiques um, of these kind of approaches to security have been well rehearsed, but, you know, it, it's worth responding restating that this project of protection always involves protecting some individuals over others, dependent on notions of belonging and citizenship, that it pivots around individualized notions of rights and protections against the communal or the collective, um, and that the, security, that the securing of property or property rights is a, is a key concern, so that, um, you know, there's a kind of class relationship to how we sort of think about or how security comes to be implemented. Um, earlier, like, etymologies of the word security referred to both a calm state of mind and the absence of dangers. Security, in the latter sense in particular, alludes to a harmonious state of humanity, a kind of utopia, something that we might strive towards. And while I think that we ought to be cautious about advocating for a society entirely eliminated of risk or danger when the danger is so often used um, to approximate otherness or difference. There is something to be said for conceptualizing security instead in terms of the presence of healthy social and ecological relationships. Um, and this opens up the possibility of thinking about security in terms of a broader conception of social well-being, centering people and community. So what would it mean if we could mobilize um, a sort of ground up way of thinking about security, a, a sort of collective um, more radical approach that wasn't just kind of reactive, uh, of which of course necessarily important to uh, to the security state, but 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 start with a kind of ground up approach of talking to people um, about what security or insecurity means in their lived day to day lives. Such a framework would help us move away from um, the kind of norms. Of, of hegemonic masculinity of na you know, that's so embedded in national security policy making, um, where sort of discourse is reduced to a calculus of threats or coercive and or coercive responses, um, and instead allow us to think more in line with abolitionist feminists um, and, and those of, of kind of that ilk who suggest that security is to live without fear but where fear is not typically located in some abstract sense of external threat, but more immediate concerns around food, subsistence, around access to clean water, around health, around housing, around shelter, um, you know, around the freedom to be in public and private space without fear of bullying, harassment, or intimidation. Um, and so, I, I mean, I, I guess I would just, sort of encourage us to think about how we think about um, more radical approaches to security policy um, in ways that don't just respond to the violence, um, which is absolutely necessary and, and certainly work that I've been really involved with, but um, that don't just respond to the, you know, the, the violent actions of the state in the name of that, that are done in the name of national or international security. But, but actually to sort of think a bit more radically and, and to sort of cultivate a more, um, a more radical positive response or collective approach to thinking about what um, security might mean in a, in a more positive sense. I think I'll end there. Great, many many thanks, Nisha, um, and and certainly in terms of um, the turn to everyday security and insecurity, uh, it's something that came into the critical security studies sort of scholarship 
maybe maybe seven or eight years ago, but but never never really kind of had an impact, I think. Um, but I think the underlying set of contentions about how we think about security are, are more relevant now than they were when those initial interventions were made. Um, uh, let me hand over to uh, to our final speaker, uh, Paul Rogers. Thanks so much, Nick. Uh, I've really listened with and seen with huge interest the the four contributions I've had so far, and so many of them gel with my own experience. I must start with one thing. Uh, Ruth mentioned, sorry, Harmony mentioned earlier on her experience of doing the UN-sponsored trip uh, through to uh, Somalia. Uh, my first job, which was seconded from a, a university lectureship in life sciences at that time, so we were working in East Africa for part of the British aid program. And I worked there for two years, got a quite a reasonable local salary as a single person enough to live on, and I got a paid a supplement. And in fact, that never even came to the country's concerned. It stayed in my bank account in Britain, yet was formerly part of the British aid program, so to speak. And I think it's an example of the kind of practical problem that you have as an individual in a sense of, you know, uh, the, the kind of interrelations between officialdom and yourself. Um, I've worked in, in the sort of broad international security field, particularly environmental security, for the best part of 40 years. Uh, and I've tried to combine the academic work with the policy related work. Uh, and that has involved, for example, teaching at defense colleges for most of that period. And in a sense, keeping your foot in in both camps without actually ending up doing the intellectual splits. But the issue here, I think, is that uh, the kinds of problems we have, which have been very well illustrated by the, the four previous speakers, are the relationship between the academy uh, and the world at large. And I think this is probably even more heated when it comes to security. I was very struck by what Nisha was saying at the end in terms of what do you really mean by security? And I think most of that work, if anything, is being done more by NGOs than, than by people in the academy. I'm uh, pleased to see that Richard Reeves joining us as Director of Rethinking Security, because that I find a very a fascinating website. I've only been involved with it peripherally in terms of the kinds of things it's saying. And certainly what Nish was saying about the way you understand security, a shared freedom from, from uh, fear and want, um, and as a common right. Uh, it's very much a patient practice. It is not something which is short term, it's very long term uh, and has to be sort of working into a culture. And absolutely, it's a shared responsibility and we're looking much more widely than normal views of security. But contrast that uh, with the way that security actually works. I'm using that term fairly broadly, concentrating on the military element, obviously. But in broad terms, um, uh, again, as, as people like Celia McEwen and others involved with rethinking security have said, it essentially privileges national interest. It's concerned with the nation. It's not concerned with the impact of the nation on other states so much. It is defined by what is frankly a pretty narrow establishment, uh, essentially a kind of community uh, popularized, in fact, curiously by Eisenhower and his a uh, validatory address back in what was in 1960, the military industrial complex. But that is really quite a narrow, uh, self-sustaining and almost self-organizing group, um, primarily with short-term interests uh, and really seeing security as really a province of the military. Um, why is this? I mean, I think the narrative is dominated by a small group and that does include, you know, uh, if you look at the rate at which um, governmental money in the defence field fills in, fa falls into many different aspects of university work and funded work, funded in universities. Um, you do get a disproportionate business influence inevitably, uh, particularly the international side, but not just in the international side, but also there's a kind of institutional inertia which affects most governments and most societies in terms of not wanting to embrace the possibility of thinking things differently. In Britain, it's a major problem because we still have this delusion of post-imperial grandeur. But at the same time, it's a problem which I think is really pernicious in the very long area. And I would certainly also highlight, again, this has been touched on, uh, what Celia McEwen calls hegemonic masculinity, a, a sort of a culture which pervades the entire field and in many ways is sort of abstracted from real life impacts. But you put that all together and you have a kind of edifice which is really pretty difficult to crack, but not so much crack, it's really pretty difficult to open up to a wider range of thinking. As I say, this is one of the biggest 
uh, challenges, in my view, for the academy to actually help process that, uh, really facilitate that process. Uh, I think if it's possible to do that, then we may be able to look at other forms of approaches to security. If you just allow me another minute or 90 seconds, I just want to give you one specific example. Two years ago, the British government published what was called the National Biological Security Strategy. It's a very good document, very much expert led with many academics involved, which really set out how to keep the country safe, principally from pandemics, but also from the accidental or deliberate use of biological agents. Um, that basically was one of the reasons why Britain, about a year or so ago, was hailed as one of the best countries in being prepared for a pandemic of any country. Uh, we know now that Britain turned out to be one of the worst, and it's the politics of how in practice the theory was not car carried when you really had a very good strategy laid out, which seems to be extremely important. There were specific reasons. Uh, the government of the day had just won an election, was really on a high. It was hugely concerned with Brexit. Uh, it was very much concerned with a much more sort of uh, neoliberal approach, which didn't brook this kind of governmental interference. But as well as that, I think this illustrated the nature uh, of the entire sort of paradigm that existed. Uh, that was not at the centre of things. Pandemics were not at the centre of the things, even though it was a tier one risk. And that seems to me a classic example, which really needs some quite serious research, a very strong example of that. And I will leave you with one obvious thought is that if you can actually approach a major issue like COVID effectively and re respond to it effectively, as a few countries have done, then you stand a much bigger chance of handling the far bigger longer term threat, which of course is climate breakdown. So let me end, you, end at that point. Yeah, thanks very much, Paul. Um, you, you bring in two themes which haven't come up previously in terms of thinking about security as, as resilience and response uh, and, and who gets privileged um, through the idea of security as protection through practices of resilience and response in, in, res in response to events like COVID. Uh, okay, um, thank you to, to our five speakers. Uh, we'll open up now for uh, questions, comments, discussion. Uh, please do use the chat. I'll be keeping an eye on that uh, and I will uh, keep an eye on the participants list and who's got a raised hand and who hasn't. So um, let's open the floor to questions now. Uh, Ellie, yeah. I think everyone is just too impressed with what was said before. It's very difficult to, to add anything or even a question. Um, I was just wondering about um, what Harmony, how Harmony talked about some of the fundamental problems that or challenges that also arise, the kind of being co-opted when engaging with um, with the policy realm. And I was wondering whether the other speakers had had similar experiences um, in their in their activities. I could certainly endorse what Harmony has said. Um, I've been involved um, peripherally with MI5 and MI6 because of the nature of my work. I've never sought any kind of security classification, uh, which is, is a great value because then you're only using public domain intelligence. But it leads you into some very weird situations. I remember giving, um, basically doing a briefing, not in COBRA in the cabinet office, but in COBRUB, that's committee room, cabinet office brief, briefing room B. And it was basically on whether there was a risk of a conflict with Iran. And this was to a group of people from all the security services and from the military and from the foreign office. And essentially it's very curious, you give your briefing and then it's open to discussion, but it's not open to discussion. It's open to you being questioned by the people concerned. They will not discuss what they think, but they will be questioning you. Mind you, you can get a good idea of their thinking by the line of questions that is asked. But you certainly get that kind of thing. And you always wonder whether to some extent you be, you're being co-opted. Um, there's no way really out of this except to, to be pretty consistent in what you're saying. Uh, but it's a, I mean, it's a problem that I think quite a few of us have had, particularly who've been in this field for some time. 
Uh, you just had to accept that if you're willing to engage with the military and with the security people, then you have to remain true to yourself uh, and retain a degree of integrity if you can. But it's very easy to be, get, get sucked in. I've had two or three occasions when basically there have been clear attempts to co-opt me into that particular establishment. Can I add just one thing briefly, because it's something that, uh, that uh, Paul said that I found interesting, and, and I, I perfectly agree. So this, this notion of hegemonic masculinity, you know, and, and it's something that, that is, is very, when we, when we study the security establishment, we see it very clearly. We see it in there. The, pro the problem that, that I find is that one, when, you're, when you're in the room, so I had, a, um, I was uh, seconded to a NATO unit for three months. So I spent three months inside a NATO unit. And on top of it, I was away from my family. I was alone in this horrible place in the outskirts of Naples. So it was, I was very isolated. And of course there was hegemonic masculinity, but it comes across so much as benign when you're inside it, right? And it is so hard to know when is the right moment to say, actually, no. And so silly things like, you know, I always have to go through the door first. It doesn't, I was there last week, even with COVID, which it creates a hell of a lot of passing by two meters, breaking all the rules, but I have to go through the door first because I'm a woman. And, the, and you create these ridiculous traffic jams if you don't go through the door first. So you make a choice. Are you gonna go through the door first? Or are you gonna make a point and not go through the door first? These are silly things, but every single day. And then eventually you do it the first time, the second time, after three months, you're not gonna create traffic jams because they don't budge, right? They do not change. It's up to you to decide how much you want to make a point of, out of it. And, and that is the, I find that the most difficult is that it's the daily practice that all of a sudden it becomes acceptable to always, I mean, I have never paid for coffee. It is my money does not, is not of no value. I am not allowed to pay for coffee, right? Because I'm a woman. So all of these things add up. And, and there are some times when you say that's enough. A colonel called me girl and I threw a fit. You don't call me girl. But that's an obvious one. It's all the little things that are not obvious. So hegemonic masculinity all of a sudden surrounds you and you have to make a choice about when it's going to be a problem and when you're going to make a fuss. Well, make a fuss. It's terrible. Look at the language I use, right? Or when you're not. Nick, is it okay if I come in? So it's, it's not so much a point about co-option but it is a point about power in those spaces. And I think it's, it's taken me quite a while to learn this lesson and I have to keep relearning it. But, um, you know, several times I've been invited to these kind of closed sessions with key policy makers or thinkers around a particular issue. So one in particular was that the um, investigatory powers commissioner was looking at the guidance that we give to security services around torture and so all the NGOs and relevant civil society people were invited to consult on this guidance and I was invited because I've written about how bad the guidance is and how it basically leaves open the door for torture to happen and you're presented this opportunity as if it's a completely level playing field so they are giving you access to power, to talk. They really want to listen. Um, this is the opportunity for them to engage with civil society. And then they can say when they republish the guidance, look, we consulted with civil society, it's fine. And so my understanding was that we were going to this meeting, it was held at Chatham House, and it would be the investigatory powers commissioner and then the civil society people. But no. The Foreign and, Common Office, Foreign and Commonwealth Office are there as well. Representatives of MI6 and MI5 are there as well. <laughs> the police are there as well. And it's not a level playing field. It's a very constrained debate where they give two hours of their time to listen to us say what we have to say for appearances sake. They take very little of it on board. They go away. And of course, around that, the rest of the time, they're consulting all the time with the powerful actors in this space. So I think the lesson I've had to learn is that when you are invited or ingratiated into these spaces, it is because of your expertise, but never be seduced into thinking that you really have 
all that much power and that you really are there as an equal player in this equation because you're definitely not and i think the the experience harmony speaks of so nicely about the hegemonic masculinities is a very subtle part of that structure of how unequal this is manifested through gender but actually i think that that the message i'd give to everyone is if you do this work and you, you know i see we've got lots of early career colleagues on the call today which is brilliant i want you to do these work research projects i want you to engage with these partners but just be aware of the seduction of being led to believe that you are taken seriously and that you're an equal player because because you're really not thank you uh, i'm just going to chip in as well i hope ken booth who's not on the call won't mind me saying this but when i worked for an ngo called oxford research group many years ago uh, when I came out of, of studying uh, peace studies at Bradford, working on nuclear disarmament, uh, and, and and you know being having my first experience of being in the room with policymakers, and thinking that yeah we, we you know we're getting access to power here, uh, and and gradually over years becoming disillusioned with that, and and Ken Booth telling me in a conversation uh, many years ago that that he he just has no truck with ideas of trying to effect change through engaging with policymakers in the way you've just described, Ruth, and, and, and ways which I'm sure a lot of us have experienced. And it does raise questions about how we think about practices of change in, in the context of these stark asymmetries of power when we're wanting to engage with, with where power still primarily lies in, in the hands of the security state and what Paul has described as, as the broader security complex. That's a real challenge um, for us to think about as a community of, of critical security scholars, I think. I've got a question on the chat from Alice, a um, specific question about how we as academics, teachers and mentors perpetuate security structures within academia uh, and how to speak to structures like prevent whilst having to implement them. How can we challenge them? Uh, so that speaks to that broader, I guess, theme of, of change and power. I don't know if, if, if uh, any of our speakers want to respond to that. Um. Nick, I can have a go. Please do, yeah, thank you. So I think this is really, really hard. And I think it's it's about power again. So my experience is of challenging these kinds of policies and practices that we're required to imp implement as academics have got easier the more integrated into the power structures of the university I have become. Now, whether we like that or not, what that means in practice is that doing that on your own early on in your career is really, really difficult. Doing it when you're more experienced and in positions of responsibility is gets easier because voices of heads of department, um, faculty leadership people are just taken more seriously. And so I think a very practical way of managing this is not to try and challenge things like prevent and its implementation in your university on your own never it's it's you're too vulnerable it's too challenging and instead i think the best strategies are identifying those people in senior leadership positions who share your concerns and working with them so that it's those voices that are speaking at university executive boards at senate meetings in faculty meetings about exactly how some of these policies are problematic. I think that's really important. You, you have so much more strength in numbers and in coalitions and crucially with people who are senior enough, senior enough in your institutions to bring about influential change. I think the other thing to say is, um, you know, of course, our, our universities are populated by both academics and professional services colleagues. And there will be people who work in, for example, our IT infrastructures who have to implement the rules. So they're, you know, told to monitor communications and internet use and so on, and they have to do that. It's worth pointing out that they're usually fairly poorly paid compared to academics. They have quite tight constraints around their capacity to interpret things freely by which I mean they can't and they have a set of rules they have to follow and I think we have to have real empathy when we're navigating those spaces where there are individuals who are charged with these duties at a kind of um, bureaucratic level 
where they don't have the freedoms that we do as academics to speak up. So I think it's really important also to be really careful about how we're critical of others in our institutions who often have less power and certainly smaller salaries than the rest of us. And I think it's thinking about how we point to mistakes or weaknesses in how these things are done without kind of blaming those who often are the least powerful in our institutions. So I think this is quite a messy space, um, but I think there's a lot of people here who've been involved in these kinds of things and, and you know, maybe it's a, a theme we could talk about through a future visa event. Um, because do you think prevent, handle, prevent is problematic anyway, but I think how we handle it in our universities is hugely important and we need to be thinking collectively rather than individually about how we navigate that um, as a community. Thank you, Ruth. Um, uh, I've got a question. Tom's got his hand raised, and then I've got a question on the chat from Hannah. So we'll go to Tom first, and then we'll we'll, we'll take Hannah's question. Um, thank you, Nick, and thanks um, for some really you know thoughtful uh, and interesting presentations. Um, you know, so far it, this has been been really really useful and really I think um, um, really in inspiring in its own pr uh, pessimistic way. Um, uh, and. I suppose I, I wanted to sort of pick up on, on, on one of the questions that sort of come up in, in various people's uh, discussions so far, which is so far, which is questions of sort of policy receptivity to what we might consider to be critical interventions. So I think at times there is a, a feeling within, you know, as, as you know, Nick said in terms of Ken Boo, just to say, well, I just don't do it. You know, I just don't want to do it because, you know, it's not going to get me anywhere. And so I was just thinking about how we might think about that sort of politically, think about that intellectually, think about it strategically in terms of how do we as a sort of community of, you know, academics think about engaging with this small community of policy, um, you know, experts and influencers um, and where there is receptivity, where we might have had positive experiences of that, but then where we might find the line being drawn and how we might work or can we work in ways that might allow us to be more influential or more successful, I suppose, in the ways that we want to affect change? Um, yeah. Nick, could I come back on that? Yes, please do, Paul. Thanks. Um, I, I think it's a, it's a key point that you raised, Tom. Um, I think to some extent, it's going back to what you were saying, Nick, about uh, Ken Boo's view. Uh, that he basically wouldn't have very much to do with it at all because you don't have any influence. I would agree with that very largely, but there are two caveats. The first is that if you talk a lot to people, particularly in the senior military, here and there you will find people who are actually really open to different views. It's often people who are sufficiently high up that they don't have to fear what their bosses, their, their superiors are going to say. And you do find that some ex-military after they retire are very much open to and will sort of go public on these views. And I think that's one area where people outside the field, so to speak, can have some influence. But the real thing is, um, there are two reasons for engaging with policy people. One is to influence them, which I think is pretty few and far between in possibilities. The other is to learn yourself. And I think one of the reasons why I've taught at defense colleges and elsewhere a lot is I picked up a heck of a lot about uh, military attitudes, defense industry attitudes and the rest, uh, just by sort of being with them and talking to them. So it's not that, uh, and then hopefully that will actually inform your work to a rather different audience. So if you're, if you're basically communicating through the more conventional academy, acad academy uh, books and journals, or if you're doing it through the likes of open democracy and the rest, uh, at any level, hopefully it improves your capability to have a better understanding of the whole system without getting sucked into it and becoming part of it yourself. I remember Mike McGuire saying uh, that one of the tricks in this business when you're dealing with people who really don't agree with you is to try and learn how to say outrageous things acceptably. And in a sense, I think he was absolutely right on that. Does anybody else want to respond to Tom's, uh, Tom's question? Can I briefly? Yeah, um, thanks, Anani. So I, I also have two reasons why I think we should, we should stay in those rooms. And, and one is that the state, those tables are still there, whether critical scholars 
enter those rooms or not. The rooms are still there, right? So you may not be able to change policy, but you are able to create at least some little level of discomfort. <laughs> and that I think is important because I think if there are rooms where there is no level of discomfort at all, that is worse than rooms in which there is some level of discomfort, but nothing changes from that discomfort. I still think that's a step forward. It's a minor, but I think still it, it's a step forward. And the second reason is because I think we have, I find, I found that there are small minor, if you want, victories that one can, one can claim. So I, I in, in this project I was doing with this NATO unit, I had this extraordinary moment where this Turkish special forces officer asked me the difference between a narrative and a discourse. And it was just fantastic. I was, it's a silly thing, but it was someone who was really trying to engage with this and really trying, and we were dealing with gendered narratives, right? Gendered narratives of women returnees. It was, it was a moment where he was pushing himself in a direction that he wouldn't have gone into without that, that, you know, that kind of, um, so those are the two reasons. I think there are very, very, very small moments where at least on an individual level, you feel that you're opening up spaces and because you create some level of discomfort. Okay. Thanks, uh, um, And let's not forget hope as well, right? There's, there's always the, the hope of change. I don't think we should discount hope. Uh, let's go on to a question on I the- I think Felipe had a, had a point as well. Sorry, I think- Sorry, was... Felipe. Thanks, Ali. Um yeah, I have well two points. I, I agree with the with the discussion about kind of staying in the room. Um, I just want to make two points. So the first one, I'm going to wax a little bit Marxist on on in this case, but I think it's important for us to see the people that we engage with. Uh, well, we the, we see the structures that we engage with as composed of workers to some degree who have varying degrees of of autonomy in their work, right? And I think that when we engage with people who have greater degrees of latitude, um, then that also it opens up actually a, a receptivity to being informed and a receptivity to changing practice. Um, so that's, that's the first one. And, and I think that there's also as an extension of that, that often we tend to meet people when we enter the room, uh, we, we tend to meet people who themselves may have just entered the room as well. Many people that, that I've interviewed in the past are sort of new in their job and often they're kind of keen to actually be informed about the thing that I was hoping to be informed about by meeting them. Um, and so in a sense, there is a tremendous degree of ability to shape um, to shape policy through early engagement with people who may have the sort of latitude to implement uh, things and to listen and learn. Um, relatedly to that, uh, I think a lot of our discussion is centering on moments of engagement in a kind of policy and impact sense, uh, but I think that we sort of need to move backwards along the along the sort of chain of research into the actual moment of data gathering. Uh, and actually the, the interview itself is a, sometimes a fantastic opportunity for this type of policy impact where uh, once you uh, abandon the pretense of going in and being a blank slate and just sort of listening and taking notes and actually sort of push back and ask questions and challenge. Um, I've had really good experiences in interviews of kind of pushing back and going, are you sure that that's right? Are you sure? And actually having pretty interesting interactions. I don't know what quantitative impact those have had, but it's just kind of just to make the point about the the research process and the data gathering process itself as an opportunity for a kind of um, two way engagement uh, in terms of the policy, uh, the politics of, of security. Great, many thanks, Philippe. Okay, let's go to the to the question from Hannah. Uh, which was uh, wondering about how impact advocacy work with states should respond to the fact that many states around the world are moving further toward the extreme right, including in the UK. Are the same advocacy tools and messages still useful? Is there a danger that advocacy becomes complicity if we approach far right governments in the same way that we've often approached more liberal ones in the past, as though this is business as usual? So I guess, how does the politics of, the, of, of the, the government with which we want to engage affect how and whether we should engage? Anyone fancy responding to that one? Can I just briefly start the ball rolling on this? Uh, the danger is in fact that you modify your message to make it more acceptable uh, in a way which pushes beyond your message. 
Uh, I think you still have, in, in fact, I would say it's even more important to be willing to try and engage and to understand where they're coming from. Uh, as you do get, uh, as we do have this problem of a move to the populist right. But at the same time, I think you have to engage, but to be very careful, you're not getting sucked in, but stay independent. It means you may be listened to even less, but you will learn a lot more about what is driving that change. Thanks, Paul. I'm just seeing if anyone else has put their hand up or posted any further questions. Uh, there's a couple of comments on the chat, but I can't see any further questions or any further hands up. Um, if you've got your hand up and I can't see you on the screen, then put your virtual hand up. Um, and I've got, uh, Cordelie's got a question, so I'll invite you to unmic and ask your question. Hello. Yeah, uh, it's been it's been a stimulating uh, stimulating conversation. I guess I have a question for for Philip and Harmony, and this is just a reflection of my own uh, my recent field work in, in Nigeria. Right, I spent about after the first week without getting you know entrance and in, getting an audience from these people, I was completely you know demoralised and I was planning on coming back because I was like, well, there's no point coming here. But beginning from the second week, you know, I started getting a bit of you know, audience and, you know, it got to a point where I was invited by the president, right? So for me, it was, it was like a big moment, right? And in, in that sort of situation, I kind of forgot about my own position to, you know, to, to, the, to the policymakers, right? It, for me, I felt like, wow, uh, I'm becoming big, getting invited to the state house and things like that. So I get my question would be, one, how to, how much should we, how much should we remain in that room? right and and how can we as researchers as well how can we know when to draw the line in terms of you know not being sucked in where do you draw the line right and apart from that i think the second question uh, specifically to, to uh, philip's point about about research data and stuff like that so how do we haven't done the research and haven't collected all of this information now coming back and knowing some of the difficulties around that right how do you reflect reflecting that in terms of how you use that, whatever data you gathered, how, how you use that in your own work, what, and how you um, perhaps make it clear to, to the readers, like look at how this, this data emerged, or look at some of the circumstances and so on and so forth. Right. Yeah, that's it. I'll, uh... Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll gladly tackle the, this kind of question of, of the room and having having sort of great success in, in, in contacting your interlocutors. Um, I'm happy that you had that opportunity. And, and that's a, such a familiar story, not that I was able to reach the sort of the heights of the state in the same way in my own work. Um, but, you know, certainly in early career and working through my PhD, um, the satisfaction of getting an interview with someone extremely high placed definitely dented my critical potential. That was absolutely the case. And I think that that came down to uh, constraints in terms of thinking about, I need to have this data. I have timelines that I need to get through. I need to just get information from this person and, and get out. Um, I think that over the course of time, certainly I've realized having had more of those interactions with people who I was extremely sort of lucky to meet or considered myself lucky to meet that the bar for i don't know i think we have the we have the fear of potentially offending people and turning them off and not getting access to the data that we want i've realized gradually that that bar is higher than i thought it was um and i sort of kind of go back to my previous point about the interview as a site of engagement and that actually you can you can push back without wearing out your welcome uh, to some sense and actually some of the people that you interact with welcome that more than you might expect and i i certainly noticed that uh, in some of the field work I did in Mauritania, where I was sort of primed to be really fearful of the security sector actors that I was speaking to, because I was told it was sort of a, you know, the semi-authoritarian state, very, very close security sector, you'll be lucky to meet anyone. But I found that the conversations and the frankness of conversation 
was was much greater than I ever expected. And I think part of that is through establishing one's credibility and establishing one's knowledge of the issue that we're speaking with that particular person about. So I think we draw the line much further than we would expect in terms of being afraid of of being kicked out of the proverbial room that we've been that we've been speaking of. Um, in terms of the second question about how we collect and, and analyze data uh, and how we present things. Uh, I think that um, I'm a big fan of using, for example, the journal article publication format and the methodology section to detail some of these kind of everyday questions of access because they do leave the trail for people who are reading to know what the critical potential is in the actual research process and how the, how the data was obtained. And also actually challenging the narrative of a relatively neat and simple uh, access to um, interlocutors and therefore a neat and simple means of potentially shaping uh, the policy that those interlocutors are in charge of putting in place. Could I add a bit to that Nick? Yeah please do Paul. Um, I think one of the things is if you're engaging with sort of any kind of state body or even a large commercial body uh, whether it's sort of semi-state like Kinetic or, or one of the others uh, whether it's MI5, MI6 and the rest. One thing you always have to remember is that all these entities are basically bureaucracies. They're bureaucracies with people who have their own uh, career possibilities, their own competitive instincts with each other. Uh, when you get near the top, it's people who are trying to make sure that the organization is getting all the money it can and the rest. Uh, an awful lot of it is, is, is down to just how bureaucracies behave, particularly large ones, and even more so ones which conduct their work primarily behind closed doors. But if you recognize that, you can see very clearly quite often that people may have this appearance of really being knowledgeable at the center of things. Uh, but I think you mentioned it earlier on, Philippe, in, in fact, many of the people are really feeling their way, but would never ever admit it, not least because of peer group pressure. Uh, and so to that extent, I think an awful lot of behavior is actually more understandable uh, than you might expect in some ways. Thanks, Paul. Can, can I just make a point following on from what Philippe was saying about the sort of access to institutions and my experience I think it's actually quite mixed and it ties into the question before about authoritarian versus liberal states I'm not sure that I mean so obviously there would be some states that would be much more um, shut down in terms of their own internal sort of security measures for who can access what and who um, can be spoke you know who 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 is provided data and who they'll speak to um but for instance i had difficulty getting access to statistical data which is public data from the home office so i mean when they you know they i was basically told that unless the research was for home office objectives i couldn't have access to the data so we had to do some other there was there was some some of these tables were public and I'd asked for, um, you know, particular, uh, slightly more um, detailed cross tabulations of the data that was, they did have collected, but they hadn't published in a, 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 the exact table form that I needed. Um, but I mean, that was just kind of one example where it was this big kind of toing and froing. And obviously that at this point I did have a, a sort of, um, an internet history, I did have a publication record where they could have Googled me and seen the kinds of research that I was doing. But nevertheless, they said, unless that I was willing to, exp you know, willing to, or pass the kind of interview test of showing that I was doing research in the interest of the home office that I couldn't get access to the data. So I, I don't think that it's necessarily this kind of like, I think it can be random. I think you can sometimes have easier access to some elements of the security state that you think might be more difficult and then some of the more um, other elements that are kind of supposed to be more more public or generic as statistics or home office statistics being quite shut down um but yeah thanks nisha harmony did you want to come in as well 
I had a, a question about um, bureaucracy uh, versus uh, the, polit the political sphere and, the, and, and politicians, and, and I think it's particularly interest for, for particularly interesting for for critical security and critical terrorism scholars because for a long time I think we focused a lot on on the bureaucracy of of terror and state violence, right, and and the, and the system and the structure of terrorism, terror, and state terror and violence, and. And to a certain degree now we, we find ourselves with, with, um, with political actors, uh, so ministers, prime ministers, presidents, who are actually going way beyond even those bureaucracies and structures and, and, and systems of violence that we were so adamant in, in and rightly, you know, in, in, in exposing and undermining. And so to a certain degree, my question then becomes in, in today's world, in, in countries like the UK or, or the US and, and certainly elsewhere, um, are we more, should we be more worried about systems and structures that are there or about the political actors that are now on top and pushing even those systems and structures to go further? And, and are those bureaucratic systems to a certain degree, at least some level of, of protection from you know the very worst that could happen if someone like Trump and and Priti Patel and and many others had carte blanche do whatever they wanted, right? Yeah, you you pose a, a, a difficult question between uh, stasis and change. I think they're harmony uh, and and the conditions under which we can imagine possibilities for what we would consider perhaps progressive change. Uh, weighed against perhaps uh, dynamics of more regressive change that seem to be taking hold in various aspects of security thinking in the security state. Um, I've got a couple of other questions on the chat. I'm just mindful of time. We've got about 10 minutes left. Um, so I had a question from uh, Nihal Abdallah, who was asking, um, are there any unique challenges people of colour or minorities face in regard to having a critical perspective on security, especially outside academia? She says that as a Muslim woman, she's had experience, uh, experience that often her views are tied to her identity. And she challenges problematic issues in counterterrorism or countering or preventing uh, violent extremism, then they are sometimes perceived, perceived with a certain amount of suspicion. And if any of our panelists would like to come in on respond to that. I'll, I'll kick off. I think I think that's a really important and interest and, and interesting question and, and something we can't we can't ignore, right? Mm -hmm. The way we we are perceived when we enter a room is is very much uh, you know linked to gender, race, creed, and and uh, and there are certain um, characteristics that are going to make lead particularly people in the in, in the security sector in the state sector to make assumptions about. Uh, why we are, have certain positions. Um, in some cases, it's, it can be an advantage. So, uh, you know, people assume that I, as a woman, particularly from a peace studies background, will be making certain arguments. So I can push those arguments a little bit further, maybe, than if I were a man, maybe. I don't know. Maybe I can, because they, there are assumptions made about women and peace and all this stuff that, that come to my advantage. But, I, but that doesn't necessarily help at all. Um, in, in in other in other cases, um, I think the the more uh, people of color, uh, people from religious uh, groups, um, women enter these spaces, and the, hopefully the less that will be the case. Right, the more women there are, the more people of color there are, and the less people will assume that all people of color, all Muslims, all women think in the same way, and the more there will be a re recognition of variety, and that you know. We're not only those things. Thanks, Harmony. Nietzsche, did you want to come in on that as well? Yeah, um, just to say that there has, I mean, I think there's actually been quite a, a bit of discussion about this um, within the sort of security academia, um, the critical security folks working on this stuff and amongst Muslim scholars who who engage with this stuff there's there's a, a broader kind of theoretical point about um you know that's often made around who, who gets to speak and on what terms do we speak about certain topics and um and obviously that's intrinsically linked to one's identity so um you know 
somebody who is identified as kind of white, male, um, you know, non-Muslim on counter-terrorism can say something and then a Muslim person can say the same thing and they can be read and um, responded to very differently. Um, I mean, I, I think that one just, you know, there are, there are certain, I, there are multiple ways in which one kind of has to, to, to try and navigate this like from a personal, uh, your own sort of um, point of sort of sanity or, or, or self protection. It's being, you know, having a group of people that you can talk to about the research that you're doing and have kind of a mutual support thing going on for, in terms of the more professional and public facing um, side of things, it, I guess it's just a matter of, you know, thinking about this, you know, arguing back in terms of using other kinds of methodologies to support the work that you're doing. So recognizing that, you know, so, so, uh, you know, putting forth things like that, there is no such thing as, you know, scientific, scientific objectivity or all subjects, the kind of feminist ab ab approaches to thinking about how we do research and, and what that means for how, you know, and, and using that to, to sort of, um, as was just said, like informing your own perspective, but actually validating it in a kind of um, scholarly way in terms of how you write and what you write. And, uh, and perhaps just, um, you know, the, the more you do it, it, it gets, you, you get stronger in terms of the arguments that you make and um, the positions that you say in, in, in terms of being taken seriously. But it, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a battle. Thanks, Nisha. I, I'm just going to um, take uh, one more question from uh, the chat, which was, just let me scroll back up, uh, from, uh, from Zainab, um, which says, uh, Zainab uh, writes, following your talk, Nisha, on how we can work towards a security politics that doesn't privilege hegemonic masculinity, and moves towards, or how can we work towards a security politics that doesn't privilege hegemonic masculinity and moves towards that which is more feminized? So I guess that is moving from diagnosis to to more engaged action on this. Um, uh, so so we've got about five minutes left. So uh, I'll, I'll maybe maybe cast that as the final question to our panel. I, I mean, just to just to say, I think that um, I mean, so that's obviously a huge question and one, and one that uh, is difficult to deal with in this time that we have. Um, but I, I mean, there are multiple obstacles to this. I think, especially, I was just watching a documentary yesterday about um, I, about the you know this the digital the the sort of full extent of surveillance capitalism and surveillance culture that's come off of the kind of digital realm in which we currently inhabit and what that does for people's ideas and thought processes and polarization of societies and and i i guess just to kind of um make the point about how increasingly difficult it is to try and engage with parts of society who want to be you know who, who are sort of um seeming increasingly hostile to uh, a sort of more radical or positive holistic kind of sense of society that we might want to see. Um, but there are, you know, feminists, there are community um, workers. I think Ruth said at the beginning about how important it is to work with, um, you know, non-academic agencies and organizations. And there, there are um, lots of, community-based organizations who who are doing this kind of work um, that I think academics can feed into but also learn from in terms of doing a, you know doing these kind of community or um, gr grounded based projects that sort of start to engage using different vocabulary but essentially starting to think about the same kind of things about what you know what people are fearful of what 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 that means in terms of changes to one's local vicinity or in one's neighborhood 
and then I guess that the, the the task is to sort of build that up and so it becomes a kind of a broader agenda of course the law and order discourse or narrative is so entrenched in its particular ways and of course it's a big industry so it you know that is itself its own battle but I guess the, the point I was trying to make was just to say that you know there needs to be a more proactive a more um, proactive or positive agenda around security to have to be taking place at the same time that we fight against um, the, the the sort of securitized state that we're we're talking about. Could I just add very briefly, Nick? Uh, I think one of the issues here, it's particularly difficult for uh, students, researchers, and particularly um, younger staff, if they're working in a fairly isolated environment. In other words, if there aren't other people in their own faculty or even department who share similar views. Uh, I don't know whether Harmony and Nick would agree, but we were incredibly lucky at Bradford in peace studies 20, 30 years ago, because there were so many people who had a broadly similar kind of experience could share it. And it was sort of mutually empowering. That's much more difficult on the issue that uh, Nisha and, and, uh, and others may face. But I think what is important is that there is a sort of reaching out across the sector. I think this is actually an extremely important role for BISA, incidentally. Yeah, I'd second that, Paul, that, that having done my undergraduate at, at um, Peace Studies and then my PhD with you and worked for an NGO in between, it was a bit of a culture shock to realize that that kind of a, that community of, of really applied scholars that worked hand in glove with NGOs across the world was not really normal. Um, could I invite uh, Harmony or Ruth or Philippe if you want to come in with, with a, a response to that question or perhaps a final thought? We've just got a minute or two left. Just, just one thought, Nick, and I've kind of um, alluded to this in the chat as well. Much of this transformation around research has to start in our institutions too. So we are not diverse as institutions. You know, the professoriate is still largely male and white. It's changing, but progress is slow. And so I think um, for our research to be in a position where hegemonic masculinity is challenged and alternative views are, are prominent, we've also got to kind of get our house in order so please you know there's a politics to our profession get involved in those efforts in your institutions to really improve hiring practices properly supporting students who face you know we know that black british students have an attainment gap because they are thwarted at every level find those ways to positively support those students and give them the opportunities we've all enjoyed and those are it's hard work but it's the stuff you have to do to change ourselves from within so that challenging those structures outside can be done from a position of strength. Thank you. Thanks, Ruth. Very nicely put. Philippe. Yeah, just to uh, bring, bring together the, the last two questions, I think it's important to kind of look at the intersections between the two. So um, when I, I'll just kind of speaking from personal experience, when I look back at accessing particular spaces as a researcher, I often sort of think about the balance, right, which is, uh, am I being hurt by being a person of color or in some African context, perhaps advantaged by it, or am I being more advantaged by, by being male? <laughs> and so uh, often that's a, that's a kind of tricky, tricky set of things to balance. And it's often actually, you often get a, a double disadvantage or a double advantage depending on, on, on the particular context. But I agree with the kind of, when we think about the study of security politics and we think about how we think about our, our academic field, the, the answer is again, opening up opportunities for, for racialized scholars. That's, that's a kind of the, the simplest, but perhaps the sort of uh, economically demanding question in terms of, I, I, think, I think Ruth mentioned in the chat, right, about more, more scholarships, these types of things. I think that's, that's the key because we, I don't think we can do a huge amount about the, um, about the kind of biases that feature in the world of security politics that we're studying. Thanks, Philippe and Harmony. I think also, I mean, I agree with you know, everything that's been said. I think it's also important for, particularly for early career uh, researchers or PhD students to, um, to, they can reach out to people beyond their university, right? I mean, I think it's important. This is why BISA and, and 
and institutions like this work well because it allows you to access people and and then say oh i saw you on this panel you don't walk in my institution but i'm working on this and i could really do with your advice on this question or that question and i know i've you know i've, I've benefited hugely from from mentorships and you know when i arrived at kent ruth was already here and and it was it was really important for me to have someone that i could go to and and ask questions and how does this work and why is this person not being nice to me and you know things like that um but i i think we can reach across institutions we don't we don't have to find someone specifically in our own university or in our own department and 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 there is there is i think there's a lot of goodwill uh, particularly in critical studies to to help others to to manage these rather difficult situations particularly uh, as we know early career is is getting harder and harder right we, we we're all aware of that we know that thanks very much harmony um we're we're up on um 3.30. I know that beta are fairly regimented in cutting us off. So I think we'll draw the discussion to, the, to a close there. Let me give uh, um, uh, my thanks uh, on behalf of me and Tom and Ellie to Philippe and Harmony and Nisha and Ruth and Paul for uh, speaking today um, and sharing your words of wisdom and your experiences. Um, I guess I'll just end with a, with a final note. There's a lot of work to do, isn't there, uh, in terms of how we investigate and theorize and challenge the structures of security in the UK uh, and elsewhere in ways in which we think can move things in a progressive direction. Um, so um, thanks again to everybody. Thanks to you for your questions, those of you that participated. Uh, and I trust this will be part of a continuing conversation between our scholarly community and our partners outside of academia. Thanks very much. <laughs>